over the next couple of days, you're gonna hear from farmers, farm workers, um, you're gonna hear from businesses, you're gonna hear from government representatives, elected officials, um, on, on ways that we can work together to really try to bring our, our, our Rio Grande food system in ways that really um, benefit us all. And you know that the Rio Grande Valley in particular is one of the, the most important areas to try to do this work because we produce as much food as we actually need. In, in fact, we produce enough food to feed more than three times our population when it comes to food, fruit and vegetables, when it comes to sugars, when it comes to proteins. Um, and yet we still are uh, one of the areas that has the highest relate, uh, rates of uh, food-related diseases and, and highest rates of food insecurity in the country, right? So if there's a way that we can reconnect our food system to actually you know, take the energy that's being spent on food here in the, and on growing food here in the Rio Grande Valley and providing that food for our residents. Um, that's the conversations that we're gonna have over the next couple of days. So I welcome everybody who are here for this conversation. Today we're gonna feature a film that talks about the efforts of farm workers and, 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 and organizations that have supported farm workers um, here in the Rio Grande Valley and throughout the state of Texas. Farm, work, farm worker rights are one of the top uh, issues that we've identified um, as part of this advisory, bigger advisory council. And, and we have, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to talk about this issue over the next couple of days. Today's film is, is, is about the history of the United Farm Workers here in Texas. We're gonna show the film, and then after the film, we're gonna have a panel of, of, of folks who you might recognize from the film, and then others who are involved in the conversation around farm, farm worker sustainability um, here in, in, um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And the conversation is going to be moderated by Dr. Wajardo. We're going to introduce the panelists after the movie. So let me just let Dr. Wajardo welcome everyone on behalf of the museum, and then we'll get the movie started. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Thank you for coming to the museum. Uh, some of you, of course, or most of you are here because of the food summit, although some of you are here because you're in class. So raise your hand if you're in class this afternoon. All right, well, God bless you all. Yeah, okay, good. So these are, these are students uh, who are in the College of Education, and they're going through some really good, honest teacher preparation you know, protocols here, and as part of Professor Jupp's um, induction process for them, he wants them to be exposed to experiences such as the one you're gonna have today. And so he also brings it to the museum, which hardens us because we want everybody to come to the museum. So my name is Francisco Ojalo, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the museum. I'm just curious to know who here is from out of town. Raise your hand if you're from out of town. All right. Yeah, it, I'm sorry, what was that? Mission? Uh, <laughs> you're not really from out of town. Who here is from outside the valley, I should ask? Outside the valley. All right, so where, where are you all coming from that you're from outside the valley? Austin. Austin, okay, yes. Washington. Washington, D.C.? D.C., yes. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Mexico, how about that, good. And then uh, some of the others here. Uh, Austin via New Mexico via Arkansas. Okay, you're just showing off, aren't you? <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> so a lot of different places, and then Austin, Austin San, Antonio. San Antonio, and then who else had a hand up? Okay. All right, well, welcome to the Museum of South Texas History. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to be part of the museum. And so, so I'm hoping that if you are not a member, and I'm curious to know who is a member of the museum, raise your hand if you're a member of the museum. So, Allison, you're here all the time, and then students, every single one. This is part of the deal, right? So, Jim, you bring your students to the museum, and you buy a membership for them, and then, you know, and, and so we, we got you locked in for a whole year, and we love that. So, the, the program tonight is, is really steeped in history. And I just want to set this up a little bit by saying that we had a museum platica this afternoon that was probably about a 90-minute platica that I had with Rebecca. And so I said to Rebecca, Rebecca, you really are a historical character here. You know, not just a historical character, but I think a real hero in, in the, the whole kind of movement on civil rights, human rights, farm worker rights. 
You're gonna see some of that in this film. You're also gonna see a number of images that were actually snapped by esteemed photographer Alan Poe. So Alan, if you would just raise your hand. And so Alan is always obviously behind the camera. And so you wouldn't know, you know, because it doesn't have the, you know, a, a name on that. But a lot of the images you're gonna see up there are images, photographs that Alan took, probably from the maybe early 70s, Alan, all the way up until, I don't know, maybe yesterday, because you continue to take photographs. And so we're happy to have them. We also have Juan Raigosa's here. So Juan, levanta la mano, por favor. So Juan is an organic farmer, and I'm not sure if Juan is gonna come up here, but he's certainly welcome to come up to the pad to be a panelist with us today. And, and then, is Maria Gomez here today? Maria, la señora Maria Gomez, Maria Gomez, Luchista desde el día que nació. ¿Verdad que sí, María? So, María nos va a acompañar. Ella va a ser panelista hoy y va a compartir historias de ella misma. Y la van a ver también en la película. A María. Because María is also one of those heroes who has been fighting the good fight for many, many years. And so, this is also, I have to say that, uh, to reiterate uh, what Alex said, that this is partly funded by, well, actually exclusively funded, right, by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation out of Battle Creek, Michigan. So the Kellogg Foundation has always been a very generous foundation that cares about food systems, equity, uh, racial healing is part of the portfolio of the Kellogg Foundation. So we hope that, that all of those things come together today as we tell good stories and, and have a good conversation. I hope that we can have good interaction here after the video when the panelists will talk, but then they will want to engage you. Juan, we're gonna start with you. So, it, it, introduce yourself, Juan. Tell our friends here who you are. And, and then, Juan, if you would just briefly speak to what it is that you saw, kind of in a personal way. Okay, so, Maria, lo que estamos pidiendo es que se presenten, cada uno, y luego si puede, ofrecer una observación de lo que acaba de ver usted. Okay, so we'll do that. If everybody could just do an introduction and then a reflection on what you saw, and then we'll move to the next question, and then shortly thereafter we'll ask for audience uh, participation. Go ahead. Uh, buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Juan Regoza. <coughs> uh, I'm an organic farmer here in the valley. Uh, my schooling is uh, agronomy, and uh, I had the opportunity to watch the movie before, uh, very illustrative, uh, learn a lot of things that happen here in the valley. And uh, as a farmer, I see some things that even nowadays uh, are still happening, uh, which tells me that in order to see change, uh, it's, it's hard, it's gonna be hard. I mean, we can talk about it here, but I see something still going on, after, even after all this work and effort, and so uh, that's what I, I get to uh, from the movie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Gomez. I live in the area of Par. I was a worker in the for a long, long time. Muchos años al mirar la película esta, pues uh, miré a muchos de, de los que participamos en esa lucha y aunque muchos ya se han ido, verdad, todavía quedamos algo otros todavía aquí para continuar en esta lucha, que la lucha no termina porque el trabajo del campo todavía sigue con sus con sus bajos sueldos y y, y con los los tiempos que tienen que trabajar lloviendo o haciendo sol, entonces. Yo creo que tenemos que continuar todavía para que esto uh, sea mejor para los que los que nos llevan la, la, los vegetales a nuestras a nuestras mesas. Claro, los compramos en la tienda, pero me dicen también bien caros y pues les pagan bien barato por el trabajo que ellos hacen y mucho sacrificio. Gracias. My name is Rebecca Flores and uh, um, I was uh, in this area for many, many years working in this movement. And, um, and like Maria says, um, we, we were out, we've been out in the fields the, in the last month or so and uh, wages are still rock bottom. Uh, 
when you compare to how what you pay for at the grocery store, uh, there's just such a huge divide uh, between uh, a picker who's been picking something, uh, you know, ten miles away from the gro HEV grocery store. It's just it's just it's out, outrageous to me that that continues to happen. And uh, I think this is this idea of this equity, uh, which I don't think will ever happen. But never, never, it's a good word, right? Um, but I think we might want to think about how, how we can, as a community, and many of you maybe were farm workers or your families are farm workers, as a community, how consumers, you who consume the product, can connect with the worker in some way. And I, I'm kind of visualizing maybe something because it's happening in Immokalee, uh, Florida, uh, some way to do that so that so that HEB, what he asks for you to pay, some of that money goes goes to the worker. Anyway, it's it's something to think about. Well, I'm Alan Pogue from from Austin, from really Corpus Christi, it's where I was born. Uh, and I started taking pictures when I was in Vietnam. I was a chaplain's assistant and also a combat medic. And so I was taking pictures, and I because what I saw wasn't the same as what we were being told at home. You know, people were, the Vietnamese people were being treated very badly. And uh, I returned to the United States and I had my camera. So I started taking pictures for what we call the underground press. Uh, you know, the anti-war and pro-feminism and really every issue that was spoken of in, in this movie. I mean, we had, our organic farm, Mantis Gardens, and we started co-op food stores, which grew into Whole Foods and everything else. But uh, in 19, well, in the early 70s, because I was working with the underground press, I was photographing the boycotts against table grapes and head lettuce that were being promoted by the United Farm Workers. But it wasn't until 1975 that I got really involved. And that is because a grower got up on, in the back of his pickup truck and shot at farm workers here in the valley who wanted a little bit more for each bushel of uh, cantaloupes they were picking. And the out, the, what was really outrageous was the person shooting at the farm workers was not arrested, never spent a night in jail. How could that be, you know, shooting people? And so there was a, a very large well, demonstration was called for to support the farm workers. And many people from Austin and around Texas came to the huge march here in the valley. And I was among them and I took pictures. But then I started talking to uh, farm worker advocates and organizers and they got me involved in photographing their activities, actually going out into the fields with leaflets and leafleting the workers and having other demonstrations and coming to Austin. Uh, so I, I started photographing all of that and I met Ed Kruger. And Ed Kruger got me involved with paying attention to the maquiladora workers. And in particular, one particular worker who had both of her hands cut off by LG Electronics while she was making uh, the backs of televisions. And I have lost touch with this person. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to find her again, but it's very difficult. Um, and so every everything in the movie is something that I, I know about, but you know, not the very beginnings, not 1965, because I was other places. But, uh, I was ultimately asked to photograph all over the country from New York State to all over California and Michigan and Florida farm workers. And uh, I have boxes of these prints which I'm happy to show uh, sometime. Uh, I didn't know which pictures to bring so I brought all of them. <laughs> I have a wagon load literally. Uh, so that's my Oh, 
Oh, she asked me if I was going to, to sell them. Well, of course, I'm always happy to sell a photograph. That's what I do for a living. You know, some people think that I have some institutional backing or I'm a professor of photography or something. Well, I'm not. You know, I'm an individual person who takes pictures of anything that has to do with social justice. And so this is the book the University of Texas published of my work. And it's, I call it a Whitman sampler. It's a little bit of everything. You know, I've literally been all over the world. Photographing in prisons, too, is another big subject. Uh, farm workers, uh, those are my two largest bodies of work. But I've done a lot of anti-war work all over the world. I've been to Iraq five times. And Haiti is uh, dear to me. That's all there. And then I was, I was down in the valley uh, uh, teaching children how to take pictures and uh, also up around El Paso. And this is a book of their photographs that we compiled. Uh, Jaime Shaheen in uh, San Marcos. Uh, they keep changing their name. It used to be Texas State, you know, San Marcos. And, uh, but anyway, it, it, they did a great job with their, their little cameras. And uh, I, I helped them do it so you can look at this. Now this book, I don't even know if you can buy it. I, I wouldn't know where to get it. I'd have to go harass Jaime Shaheen in San Marcos to find any other copies of it. But anyway, that's... Thank you. So, Juan, let's, uh, and everybody, let's think about this, this issue of, of uh, okay, so this panel is called Harvesting Justice. So Juan, when you, when you see the film, so there's a number of things that swirl in your mind. I mean, I, you, you articulated some of that. But you're a farmer also, Juan. And you, you have to deal with every phase of the harvest. You and your family run an organic farm. Your children are involved. Your wife is involved. You hire people. Talk about, from a small farmer perspective, how just the work is. Well, <clears throat> I, I was giving it a thought to, after we watched the movie uh, earlier last week, I guess, and just pondering, um, about all this whole situation with the, the farm workers and farming in general. Um, and like I mentioned, it seems like this problem has happened for, for so many years. Uh, you know, starting with slavery, uh, also perception. Uh, I, especially here in the valley, uh, a lot of, uh, I've heard, I'm not from here, from the valley, but I've heard uh, the parents encouraging the the kids to drop, I mean, not, not to go on or get out of the fields. And uh, I think all that leads to the perception of farm work, farm work being of a low level. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big issue uh, in, in, my, in my situation with my family. We're a first generation. Uh, farmers, uh, some of my ancestors, they were agronomists, but they were more on the research side. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've had to build up a little, you know, a few surquitos, a few rows. We have been uh, working through the years and, and we have grown a little bit. We're still a very small scale farm. But yeah, you're right. We, we've had to uh, experience uh, harvesting in the cold, in the rain, um, harvesting our product and, and not selling hardly anything because it started raining at the farmer's market, the people didn't show up, or having issues with the weather. And so, thank, I mean, thanks to being there, I've been getting a little bit of a sense of being a farm worker, but it still doesn't compare. Um, farm workers that I've seen around, they work 
way harder. We do that like once a week on, on Friday night, we will harvest our product for, for Saturday farmer's market. So it's just a, a portion, small portion of, a, of what a farm worker does. Sometimes seven days a week, 10 hour shifts. Uh, but yeah, we, we've had a, sometimes harvest, the people start harvesting four in the morning and finishing 7 p.m. That's uh, more than 12 hours. And so I think it needs more justice. Well, what you were saying, how just it is. I think um, uh, the farmers and farm workers, it needs some change. Um, and uh, what I was thinking, you know, just I don't know if it's going to happen, uh, like uh, they mentioned here. But I was thinking, how can we fix this? It's going to be very hard because it, it started many years ago with, with, in a way, with slavery from there on. But I was thinking the way to start at a small scale fixing this situation is uh, going local. Uh, like all of us here partnering with a farmer that really cares about farming, good food, and farm worker uh, quality of life and compromise to buy the product of that farmer and also provide knowledge, let's say, uh, working as a group. Let's say here in the audience we have a business person because on the farm, farmer side, it's very hard for a farmer to grow, to market, to um, repair and take care of everything, but working as a collaborator will be, I, I visualize as an option to improve the lives of farm workers. If, uh, you know, a little group of people will uh, pitch in ideas and knowledge with a farmer so that farm could provide better salaries. But the only way is secure the purchase of the product of that farmer because it's very, we've seen it many times where our product you know, like we had a problem with the weather, we don't have the quality, and we're struggling to sell it. So once a farmer secures the sale and, uh, and uh, with a, a fair price, then that farmer can start uh, paying uh, a, a better salary for the farm work. That's just an idea. Maria, ¿cuántos años tiene usted de estar trabajando en, en esto? ¿Cuántos años tiene usted de estar trabajando en esto? ¿En el campo? En el campo y, y abogando por okay. campesinos. Ok. <coughs> uh, nosotros salimos de una huelga de cebolla. Andábamos, entonces, en ese entonces los niños podían andar con nosotros cuando no había clases. Y de ahí para acá <coughs> uh, empezamos a, a, a la lucha, a mirar que había... A trabajo que de, podíamos hacer para nosotros mismos y para los demás. Entonces, de ese día que salimos, nos salimos de, de, de la labor de la cebolla, nomás nosotros, el Señor dijo que él no, porque tenía que trabajar para sacar, para pagar los biles. Está bien. Pero cuando vinimos a la unión, nos vinimos todos para la unión, y ahí fue cuando empezamos a mirar la necesidad de, de, de luchar por los demás, de aprender. Entonces, uh, seguimos trabajando en el campo, pero luego volvimos, a, volvimos para la unión y así empezamos a, 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 a ir a las juntas y a mirar y aprender más y más, ¿verdad? Y pues uh, nos tocó andar en muchas, en muchas huelgas, en muchas uh, luchas, peleas con los rancheros, ¿verdad? Porque no querían que nosotros diéramos información a la gente en el, en el campo. Y pues algunas veces nos pusieron en la cárcel, algunas otras veces nos sacaron un, un cuchillo y todo, pero no, nunca, nunca tuvimos miedo. Y yo creo que eso es lo, lo bueno cuando estás haciendo algo bueno por los demás, no tienes por qué tener temor. Entonces yo tenía como unos 24 años y ahorita pues ya tengo más de 70. Y, y fuimos, fuimos a, ganamos muchas, muchas batallas, muchas porque en todo, en parte, la mayor parte de lo que salió en el video, ahí anduvimos, mi familia y yo, casi todos, nosotros, mi cuñado, mis hermanos, 
todos andaban, andaban, ¿no? y aquí está una de mis hijas, la más chiquita, y, y mi yerno también, y yo no sabía que iban a venir, pero bueno. Este, entonces, ella ¿Dó, también ¿Dónde están, estar... María? ¿Dónde están? Levante la mano. Este es mi Familiares hija. de María, felicidades, gracias por venir. Y este es mi yerno que está acá. Ah, ella, ella también trabajó con nosotros. Yo recuerdo cuando yo tuve a mi, a mi niña, ah, ya andábamos, porque íbamos para el norte también y, y veníamos. Tuve a mi niña y pues había que pescar el tomate, había que seguir trabajando. Me la llevaba y la ponía en como una casita de costales, do, dos, dos botes y un costal arriba y ese era el techito de ella. Pero nunca nos quejábamos, es que ya no teníamos que trabajar. Pero ya entonces <coughs> empezábamos a mirar que había necesidad de luchar para los demás también. Entonces, tengo más, más de 20 años de trabajar en la Unión de Campesinos, trabajé primero y luego uh, con Lupe, casi, yo creo que casi 30, casi la edad que tiene ella, la niña, <coughs> mi hija. Y entonces, por eso parte de esta lucha fue parte de nosotros, cuando la helada... Si sí, íbamos y picábamos la fruta que estaba, pues ya estaba caída, estaba en el, en el suelo, ¿verdad? Porque se había caído con el hielo. Pero dijimos, pues qué fácil, qué bueno y qué, qué rápido. Pero pues sí, pero nos lo pagaron mucho más barato porque no teníamos que subirnos a un árbol con la escalera a bajar toda la fruta. Sin embargo, trabajamos, hicimos el trabajo, ¿verdad? Y, y yo creo, siempre he dicho yo que uh, la unión ha sido como una escuela para muchos, muchos de nosotros donde hemos aprendido, yo sé un poquito de inglés, entiendo, hablo muy poquito, pero en la casa con mis bisnietos, pues trato de hablar un poquito, ¿verdad? Porque el niño no habla mucho español. Entonces, todavía sí también traté de aprender un poco, un poco, ¿verdad? Pero lo que más aprendí fue, yo creo que, <coughs> a hacer, a luchar, luchar para nosotros mismos, pero también para los demás. Entonces todavía voy, ahorita ya estoy retirada, ya me retiré porque me operaron de mi rodilla, porque ya, pues ya no podía, yo fui organizadora en las colonias, en las colonias, entonces ya no era tan fácil para mí andar mucho en las colonias, porque saben que en las colonias hay muchos perros, y pues ya me iban a pescar los perros de volar, que no iba a poder correr. Entonces dije, yo creo que ya, es tipo. y todavía sí, lo pensé, dije, me opero de mi rodilla, me restablezco y vuelvo. Pero fue, fue cuando ya empecé a pensar, ya no es tan fácil para mí, ya tengo como unos siete años que me operaron de mi rodilla, o ocho. Y dije, ya no va a ser tan fácil porque ya no voy a poder hacer el trabajo, pero tengo que continuar. Entonces ya me retiré, pero he seguido trabajando uh, en muchas cosas que, que, que salen y pues sigo, con, continúo yendo de voluntaria a la unión, y pues a, hablando con la gente de, de, de los beneficios y, y, y cómo podemos hacer el trabajo mejor entre todos, ¿verdad? Porque yo sola no lo puedo hacer, pero ya tres o cuatro ya podemos hacer algo, ¿verdad? Entonces, a, es, esa es parte, parte de, de mi vida, ¿verdad? Y yo creo que yo sigo, sigo allí porque la lucha me gusta y otra cosa también, mis padres también fueron indocumentados se pasaron para acá bien documentados y luego nos pasaron a nosotros para México. Entonces, a los 15 años, mi mamá se vino para Reynosa, cruzamos el puente, fue cuando empezamos a trabajar nosotros, los que éramos ciudadanos, eran los cuatro. Bien barato que nos pagaban, 50 centavos la hora, 8 horas, y con el asadón cortito. Entonces, todo eso me dio a mí más ánimo para luchar, porque era bien poquito lo que nos pagaban y era mucho el trabajo que hacíamos. Y entonces yo creo que eso se quedó en mi mente y en mi corazón más que nada. Y pues por eso todavía estoy ahí, la Unión del Pueblo y la Unión de Campesinos. Gracias, María. Rebeca, una pregunta para ti. So you have, you, you spoke about legislation, uh, you spoke about house meetings, uh, you spoke about a number of different strategies and then um, you know, change, real change that happened during the time that you've been involved. How would you frame harvesting justice 
for the next generation. How should we be thinking about this? Issues of production of food, issues of justice. Juan spoke about economic challenges. Maria spoke about dogs in las colonias, los perros en las colonias, la rodilla que ya no le quieren funcionar. So we got all kinds of issues, right? Just the physicality, but also economic. How can we be, how should we be thinking about this? Well, one of the things that, uh, that Caesar did when, we, when he started the great boycott in the 80s uh, around the issue of chemicals and the chemicals that were being uh, sprayed on the grapes and how, how that chemical uh, came to you at your, at your dinner table, right? So he made the connection between the, the fields, the workers in the fields who were being uh, exposed to these dangerous chemicals and then he said, and you know what, you are too, because you're eating that product yourself. And so I think that, um, like uh, Mr. Juan said earlier, that there has to be a better connection between consumers, the people who consume the food that we eat, and the people who harvest it. And, and until we understand that, uh, as, as you, uh, maybe you, because you live in the valley and you see the, the fields, but uh, I live in San Antonio and uh, my grandchildren think, you know, the food comes at, out of the grocery store, right? And so we have to re-educate a whole bunch of people about where our food comes from and who harvests it, right? And who goes to the struggle of, of what Maria uh, says to, uh, to get that food, harvest it so you can eat it, right? But the troubles that those farm workers have in doing so, right, no one considers. Uh, I was talking earlier about, um, I think I mentioned it earlier, to you about a month ago I was down here and I happened on a field I just, you know and I'm I always want to know what's going on in the valley um, and so I stopped and talked to talk to the workers and they were doing leeks you know what a leek is right it's, a leek is like a big like a thick onion and do you all eat leeks I want to know if y'all eat leeks how many people eat leeks really God, I thought we only ate onions Juan, do you grow Isn't leeks? Isn't that funny? Well, anyway, so I, I, I stopped in this field and this, this worker, and there was a slew of workers there, all men uh, in the fields, uh, and I watched them work. And I said, how, how, what, what are, how, are you, how much are you paid for these leeks? He said, he would get two leeks, clean them, you know, you have to clean them, cut them, wrap two in a, with a rubber band or a, a band of some sort, and he would do 12 of these pairs of two, 24 leeks. And he would get paid a dollar fifty for those twenty-four leaks. So immediately, I asked my brother, who was here, my brother Richard, who has also worked with the union for many years, as his, as did his wife Mertala, was an organizer for the union. I asked him to check. Of course, he checked Walmart, and on that very day, uh, three leaks were being sold for three dollars and twenty-eight cents. And so the disparity between what this worker was harvesting and, and going to get paid and what Walmart was, paying, was, was going to sell their leaks for is, is huge, right? It is huge. So there's got to be a connection between what goes on at the grocery store and what goes on in the, in the fields. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at uh, the, the workers in Immokalee. These are tomato, tomato workers, and they have an organization. And what they have done is they have connected that product with Wendy's, with all the hamburger places. <coughs> The Wendy's, a lot of them there in Florida and nothing in other parts of the country. And what they have gotten agreement from those uh, uh, hamburger joints is that they'll pay a little bit of extra as long as that extra goes to the, the worker. It doesn't go to the grower, it doesn't go to the, you know, the grocery store or the produce shed or whatever, it goes to the worker. Now I don't know how they make sure that happens, but I think there's something to think about that. Here, I call the valley the Gaza Strip. Because people are locked in, right? Palfurias keeps a lot of people inside, and so and so and so you see, you know, there's a desert beyond Palfurias and San Antonio. It's like nothing goes on there. So anyway, HEB HEB has a has control in this area. Oh, they have control over the whole state. But anyway, that's all you see in this area, right? Is HEB? Same, maybe some Michoacana, J Juniors, what else? But I think when I saw those leeks uh, being harvested. And then I went, today I went to, to HEB here and I saw the leeks being sold there for $3.48. And 
And I said, just a, a matter of how many miles from south of San Juan to the store in, in Edinburgh is what? Let's say 20 miles. So how, how could that happen? <laughs> that a worker 20 miles from here is getting paid this amount and here HEB is making all this money off of that product, off of that product. And is there a way then to, uh, to work with HEB? And don't ask me to do it. <laughs> to work with HEB. <laughs> Uh, to work with HEB to see if there, if there can be some kind of an agreement where HEB buys this product, right, sells it for whatever, but that money then goes, goes into the hands of that worker so that we can raise wages. Look, you can talk about all kinds of conditions of a worker, of a farm worker. They're all poor, for God's sake, they live in Colonia, they don't have anything there. But once you raise wages, then you can raise things, right? Then you raise that standard. And now they can, they can buy their own house, they can fix their own house, they can send their kids to school or whatever, right? But they're not grubbing around looking, getting, to, getting in line for food stamps or getting in line over here or getting in line over there to get something when they can you know, pay for it on their own because they should be able to pay for stuff on their own. That is, our work should be, the way you get respect for your work is if you're paid a decent wage, if you're treated decently, right? If you get benefits, what is equity in this, in this country? Everybody talks about equity. Equity means that I'm treated, a worker is treated the same, day, the same way as I'm treated. Okay, I get treated really well, right? I sit at home, I'm retired, I just wait for my check to come in every, every <laughs> day. <laughs> but you know, that's, what, what is equity? And uh, what, is it, what is equity between a farm worker and, and a, and a, and a um, city worker? Well, you look at that, right? And so you think, well, a farm worker wants that too. Why not? You work as hard, you work harder than somebody sitting in an air-conditioned office all day long. You work harder, and so why not? Well, the question is, we know why, right? Because there's a domination in the agricultural community that keeps that worker where, he, where that worker is because they can, and so we've got to break that. And that is a big job, so we'll just throw it out there. Maybe somebody will pick up one. So Rebecca, thank you very much. So, Ellen, you're going to get a shot at this. So, Alex, if, if I could just get you to help me with something. If you would show these to our friends. And so, Alan, I'm going to show this one. So, you're a storyteller with your camera. Some other questions. Yes, we're going to get to questions as soon as Alan gets a fair share here, okay? A fair shot at, at, at commentary. <laughs> Alex, don't drop that. Okay. <laughs> so, Alan, can you speak to why you took these shots and what they mean. And so uh, let, me, let me preface it by saying, so what I'm hearing from Juan, from Maria, and Rebecca, I'm hearing some powerful testimony. And I'm also hearing for the need for story. So I'm going to ask you to, to talk about these, these images. Alex, if you could show Alan so that he can know what he's talking about. Well, I would like to start with the little girl with the pepper. Because uh, the little girl with the pepper uh, I have another photograph. Her mother's right next to her on the conveyor belt. And her, her mother's job was to pick out peppers that had a slight blemish. All they wanted was perfect peppers. So she would hand the pepper with a slight blemish to her daughter who would toss it down the reject chute just to give her daughter something to do. And the reason her daughter was there was it was a national holiday and there was no daycare. There was no one to take care of her daughter unless she took her to work. And the fellow who ran uh, the vegetable packing plant was doing her a favor by letting her keep her daughter on the line. Otherwise, her daughter would be sitting in a car in the parking lot. Or, you know, so the, the, there's so many issues that that talks to. You know, the, there's you know, no... No, not necessarily any support group for a, a woman with children who's working in farm work. And uh, so, so that's how that little girl happened to be where she was in her, uh, I guess it was her first communion dress. I mean, she is so cute. She's so beautiful. And, you know, her little earrings and her patent leather shoes and the whole outfit. It was so uh, just darling, and so I was attracted to take that picture and then get the story. And I got a lot of the story from the fellow who was running the packing shed because he knew exactly what was going on. 
Now the, the second picture of the, the boy, he, uh, he was near a mushroom growing operation, which I didn't know, but you know, growing mushrooms, it, the thing is four stories tall, it's a big wooden structure uh, full of uh, bins of horse manure where they grow these mushrooms. But this uh, child was at a, uh, I guess what you call a, a labor camp. So uh, he was there with his little sweater and his, uh, what is it, centaurs and minotaurs across the bottom of his sweater. And I'm always wondering about children and where they are and what their situation is, what their opportunities are, their educational opportunities, their opportunities for health care. And uh, so I, I, I just took his picture because it, it, you know, it was attracted to him. And then, oh, I was in, this boy was uh, in Tijuana. I was in Tijuana at the Colegio del Frontera Norte uh, with, uh, oh yeah, I love that one. Uh, and I, I see such promise in this child's face. And he's going to school. Well, good. You know, he's got his big backpack on full of books. And so he has an opportunity. And will it be fulfilled? That's always the question. And, uh... That's okay. Let's get to questions from the crowd. Sure. I think people are, are eager to ask questions. So, okay, I think the lady in the purple was the first one. And then I'm going to come to you, okay? Hi, my name is Elizabeth uh, Rodriguez Marquez, and I work at Lupe, La Unión del Pueblo Entero. I'm a community organizer there. I have also been working uh, very closely with farm workers since 2018. And um, what Rebecca was saying is a really great idea. But what I wanted to highlight is that uh, predominantly here in the Valley, we have about 80% of the workers that we have working here in, in Hidalgo County, <clears throat> which is the county that houses the most farm workers in the state of Texas. Um, they're mainly undocumented. They don't get benefits. So when the sandia is over, most of the ladies don't work in the sandia because it's too heavy for them. The real problem that are, we're facing right now is that if you talk to, um, I'll give you an example. Um, right here, 281, Little Bear Produce. Um, they have field labor contractors they're known as FLCs, who are usually licensed uh, US citizens or uh, residents. And uh, they steal wages from the farm workers. So the, as you know, uh, Rebecca was talking about the farm worker, they take home about $250 a week. And today living in America, that's not even enough for you to be able to buy a house in the Colonia. They don't live in Colonias anymore. Um, they live in small little RV parks and they live in really horrible conditions. Um, they don't get to, to afford health care, and when they get sick, they have to keep working. Um, but a real issue is these field labor contractors. Uh, Department of Labor, I work very closely with Department of Labor and Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid on these issues. I'm part of a, a farm worker coalition that is all around the state of Texas, and I have worked with uh, farm workers all over the state of Texas. Um, we have three uh, different types of farm workers. We have the seasonal farm workers that you find here in the valley. We have migrant farm workers, which are, are quickly disappearing because they're retired and their kids are grown up and they're getting their educations, which we're, we're very proud of them. And then we have H-2A workers. Florida has a large, um, they have a, a, a large uh, amount of H-2A workers that are being brought in. These are workers that are being brought in from Mexico to work seasonally on our farms for nine months. Um, these workers are exploited heavily. They're, even the HUA workers, they come in in contracts, but by the time they get here, the contractors are banking on them not reading those contracts so that then they can shorthand them. This, I just got that one call today from a farm worker that was working here in the Valley and was telling me that his, his contract says he's supposed to be making $14 an hour and he's bringing home $8 an hour. Um, but these are the situations that are going on 
field labor contractors, they have violations, violations after violations, and the package sheds keep employing them. And they don't, they are the ones that do not pay the farm workers. So the growers pay the contractors, and then the contractors do not pay the farm workers. I don't know if any of you want to respond to that. Or do no, we go to the next no, question? It's true that the farm labor contractor has been in the middle. He protects the grower. Um, and I think the Labor Department, which is the U.S. Department of Labor, oversees farm labor contractors, always have just so few workers in the Labor Department that they can't deal with all the work that's going on in the field. And so it's, it's been going on for ages. For ages. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to ask in Spanish and in English. Um, so I don't know anyone in the valley who is a farm worker in the valley, but I do know people that live in the valley, people that go to school with me, that they go work pal norte, to the north, like you said. Um, so how can organizations like Lupe, who are local, protect the rights of those people who are migrant seasonal um, farm workers? especially when a lot of them are undocumented. Like my friend, he's pursuing engineering in school right now, but him and his family, every summer they go to like Washington to do strawberries or whatever. Um, so how can locally we protect those people when they're undocumented and they don't even work here, they're leaving? Um, no conozco a nadie que sea del Valle y trabaje en el Valle, pero sí tengo un amigo en la escuela que está estudiando ingeniería y Durante los veranos, él y su familia van a trabajar para el norte. Eh, mi pregunta era, ¿cómo organizaciones locales como Lupe pueden asegurar los derechos de esas personas que, aparte de ser indocumentadas, ni trabajan aquí? O sea, ¿se van a trabajar a otros campos en otros estados? O sea, ¿qué, qué cosas podemos hacer por ellos? Pues lo único que, que sé yo es que conocemos a grupos en los otros estados. So that we know of other of groups that do this kind of work in other states, especially in those states that have a lot of agriculture. And so we can make that connection. Now, in the issue of people who don't have documents, in our union we never ask people for their papers, that they, that they were part of the, the movement, uh, no matter what you know, status they were in, as long as, as they work together with us and to, to make the changes. But uh, I, I realize that people without documents always get the, the, worst, uh, the worst treatment. Uh, we found a, a, a grower here years ago that had two sets of books, right? With one set of books, he paid the undocumented worker, which was less, right? And the other set was for the people who were legal, and he paid them the minimum wage or whatever. And so, and so they, there's, there's so many ways of getting around this stuff. Uh, the, the, and of course, everybody's fear. When I was talking to the worker doing leaks the other day, why wouldn't he talk to me? Well, I think because he, you know, he didn't want to show the, the crew leader that he was talking to me, right? And of course, the crew leader didn't know who I was, but anybody just right, like even talking to people, they, they kind of, you know, the red flag goes up. And so, yeah, it is a huge problem. It is a huge problem. It's, it's something we have got to deal with. Now, when Mr. Juan was saying, and I say that because I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, uh, is, is is we have so many immigrants coming in from Mexico who know how to work, who know how to to do farm work, right? I believe. And yet you have all these fields that that aren't being worked in this country. I, again, I, just driving down here, just acre after acre of fields is not being worked at all. And everybody says, oh, what are these immigrants? What are we going to do with them? Let's throw them in jail. Well, I I think we need to we need to give them a plot of land so they can work them, right? So they can so they so they can work them for themselves and for their families, right? Instead of putting them in jail, give them permits to work here because we are losing our land. I mean, this land, the growers here in this land have used an irrigation system that has told, desalinated all the uh, just acres going toward Brownsville. You can see the the salt. Why? Because of the ways they have irrigated, and and that's that's uh, that soil in that area is gone. I think for good, and so we have got to start practices, uh, agricultural practices, uh, like he has done in the past, to make our soil productive again, to make it grow things again, rather than just growing the sorghum and rather than just growing the, you know, those kinds of mechanized crops. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. 
but we have to have a, you know the political clout to do it. Alex, let me do a time check with you because it is uh, what time is it? It's seven. It's seven forty. Yeah. So do you do you want to begin to wrap this up? Uh, we, I know that there are some other questions out there from the audience, and I think some of the speakers will be here for a few minutes afterwards. I'm sure you guys can ask some questions. But on behalf of um, the UTRGV program in agroecology and resilient food systems and our Center for Sustainable Agriculture and Rural Advancement, I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us today. I think the conversation that we had, you know, when I saw the film, I was actually watching it last week, uh, and, then I, and then when you said, I haven't spoke to a farmer about this, and I said, okay, Juan, you, ha you have to be there, so that we can have at least a beginning conversation, because I think what you guys have all hinted at is that the, the conditions, of course, uh, the, the struggle has been continuous, but the conditions are changing, and I think, um, uh, 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 Ms. Flores, you, you mentioned you know, we, we have to kind of think differently as well to see if we can reconnect our food system with those who grow the food and work on the farm to those who eat, eat the food. And why, why is that? It's because in our program, we, we acknowledge the fact that agriculture is heavily subsidized everywhere. Like in, when, when, you, when I say that, it's either subsidized against harms to the ground and pulling energy from the soils or, um, it, you know, pulling energy from farm workers. And you know, and the cheap produce that we can get at the grocery store, exactly. even at 3.49, yeah. for leeks, is actually a, a, a highly subsidized product, right? In almost every crop, the farm wor worker and the farm the farm worker gets three percent, even less than that of the product. Coffee is even worse than leeks. When you think about the, what the you what the farmer gets for a pound of coffee versus the five dollars you pay for at Starbucks, it's it's a fraction of the cost. But what, but what um, Ms. Flores mentioned and what Juan is trying to do is trying to bring those two sides together so that the farm and farm worker, the farmer can get paid a fair price so that the small farms like Juan's farm and other farms that are more inclined to pay a fair wage, that are more inclined to treat their farm workers with dignity and respect, um, that they can actually, um, they can actually uh, you know, improve the well-being of ever, everyone together, right? And so it's hard because it's hard to take the corporations out of agriculture in, in today's world, but I think there's a small movement and you have some ideas towards that. I think that's one step in that direction. So what we would like to do for just today is to encourage you guys to continue exploring ways that you guys as consumers and, and as activists can, can look for ways to bring our food system closer together. I mean, you know, where leeks are growing five miles down the road from the store you buy them at, or when I mentioned earlier how Mission sit, sit, I, a, a School District buys none of their citrus from Mission citrus, citrus growers, wow. that right there, there we've got to find ways to reconnect that. So thank you again for your participation in tonight. Please join us for the rest of the Food Summit. We're going to have very stimulating panels like this for the rest of the week, uh, tomorrow and and, and Friday will be at UTRGV. Um, and, then, and then, but before we leave for tonight, I just want to say thank you to the Museum of South Texas History for being great hosts. And then just a real quick shout out to the conference organizer, uh, the Institute for Ecology, Scholarship, and Health, led by Do um, Hernan Colmenero. He is actually behind the scenes and And it's been a great partnership among the three of our institutions, and we hope to see you guys at, uh, at other events in the Food Summit. Thanks you one again. Uh, thanks, thanks once again to the, to the panelists. Okay.